Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today's guests are Deshaun Drew, President of Minnesota Public Radio, and Victor Hockstrom, President and CEO of PBS station KPTS TV in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you for joining us, panel, and a reminder to our webinar guests that you can ask questions to the Q&A and chat functions at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to cover those topics during the show after. It's such a pleasure to have you both here today, and, and we're here to talk about the trauma faced by the nation and the media's role in addressing it, whether it involves four centuries of violence based in race that came to a head with the videotaped killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and Ahmaud Aubrey in South Georgia, or the COVID-19 unemployment crisis that disproportionately harms people of color. It's clear we Americans have glossed over the problems of race and we must deal with it now Let's talk about what you're experiencing in your communities at this point in time, at this point of trauma for the nation. And let's talk a bit more about how we resolve it and how media companies have a responsibility to bind together civil society. And let's, let's talk with you, uh, Deshaun, first, since uh, what has happened uh, so tragically uh, just, just in the last couple of weeks originated in your town. Uh, talk about what you're experiencing. It's, it's been a challenging week here in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, as, as you said, you know, we were all dealing with uh, COVID-19, both the sort of the, the health risks tied to it as well as the economic challenges that it's wrought. And so I think um, the cushion was already pretty thin to begin with. And then the, the George Floyd um, killing erupts and, you know, the, the resulting protests and, and other acts of civil disobedience and uh it's really opened up uh a lot of pain uh but also some important discussions for our community and for our country to have about how we got to now and what are we going to do individually and collectively to to stitch things back together in, in, in ways that are healthier and more um just than than they were before they were torn asunder. We've got a ton of work to do, and I'm really grateful to be working in a news organization, media organization that has such a critical role to play in helping people understand um, not just what happened last Monday, uh, but uh, much of the story of what got us here and uh, to help people understand how they can step up in their own ways to, to engage and build the society we want to live in. And it's, it's the four centuries. It's not the last event or the next event or the event of last year or the year before that or the decade before that or all of the events that came in the preceding 30, 40, 50, 60 years of our lives. It's really this, this continued history that can be drawn from one event to the next to the next and, and binding this together from region to city in, in Wichita, what are you experiencing, Victor, and how are you uh, processing, how is your community processing what's happened recently? Well, you know, as in uh, the rest of the country, Wichita is also being involved with, with uh, protesters uh, against what has happened. Um, we've had demonstration, demonstrators all over the streets, uh, especially on our street where the station is located, and uh, people are getting tired. They're fed up with, uh, with the uh, injustices that uh, seem to be prevailing as uh, they apply to uh, uh, minorities. And so basically, um, like the rest of the country, Wichitans or people of Kansas are expressing them themselves. They are allowing their voices to be heard about, this, about the same matter. And uh, Totally, in my opinion, from what I, what I have observed, they are just fed up with it, and uh, it's time for some, some justice. And I think that brings to my mind what was once, um, when I studied uh, uh, political science, the systems theory says if a system is subjected to sufficient critical strength, it would either change to a state of equilibrium or shall cease to exist. Well, I don't expect um, the United States to cease to exist or the democratic system to do that, but I expect now from the latest uh, killing of George Floyd uh, that things will change to a state of equilibrium in the country. Uh, in other words, 
equality, real equality for everybody, and everybody should be treated the same way. Everybody should be treated the same way, but we're not. And, and part of our role in the media is to discuss those issues. Part of our role is to drive dialogue. How are you each ensuring that not only that you're covering the events that are, that are going on, but you're also uh, connecting the dots and helping people to have the discussions across different bounds of opinion and politics and, and experience so that a greater understanding is achieved and we can, based on that understanding, uh, create solutions. Please, uh, either of you should just jump in. We're well, doing it in a variety of ways. You know, on, from a coverage standpoint, um, we've, we've got talk shows and we've got news programming, right? So we've, we've used, we're using news programming to uh, spread information and, 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 and make sure important voices are being heard. But the talk shows have been able to go even deeper on some of these topics. One of our um, hosts on Sunday afternoon uh, opened up a three hour uh, show and she at the beginning of it said, and this is not typical of us, right? Uh, she said, I'm gonna invite our black listeners to call in. I'm gonna invite our white listeners to listen. And it was an amazing show, just hearing people call in and talk about the, the hopes and dreams and struggles and how this latest incident is impacting them. Uh, and, and, and just got a ton of great feedback from the community about just having that happen on our airwaves, the value of that. And then just yesterday we held um, sort of a town hall with uh, one of our other hosts and some experts in trauma on racialized trauma and policing. And it was wonderful. It was um, just a really deep 90 minute conversation about the history, the point you made before about this didn't begin in the last week or two or a year or two. It, it, it's woven into the history of this country. We had a really thoughtful but accessible conversation about the history of African-Americans in, in this land and the trauma wrought upon our psyche and our bodies you know, century after century after century and, and what it's led to from, you know, higher rates of diabetes and high blood pressure to uh, perceptions and treatment that, that, are, that are unequal. And um, we're going to continue to have difficult conversations in, in our state, in our communities that are going to help us make the change. I think the point that Victor made about you know, whether the system changes, it, it can or it can, it can be something we decide we're going to um, – continue to tolerate. We've, we've had many moments before that could have been meaningful inflection points and instead we got back to doing business as usual. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we'll be part of the, the, the change in terms of really educating our listeners and our community about um, the realities for um, people that are often overlooked and un misunderstood, but I'm not confident just because we, we've yet to make that turn. Well, Deshaun, I'm, I'm hopeful too because it, it is now pleasing to see that red and yellow, black and white, everyone is out there expressing uh, anger and uh, against what has happened. And, and, that is a, and that is very encouraging. I think this now will lead to some positive results. Uh, let's hope and pray that happens. But what we're doing locally here, you know, I believe uh, as the president of a public media station that the station should always be the voice and platform uh, for the community. Uh, and that's what we strive to do with local programming. We have several types of local programs, but the one program that we're utilizing right now is called Kansas Week, uh, whereby we bring in all of the various uh, interested and qualified spokespersons to discuss uh, the, the, the events of the time, what's happening, and to uh, give their views and opinions about, uh, about things that are going on right now. Uh, and, and, so, and tying those, our local programs in with the national specials that PBS uh, is offering uh, at this time too. So we, we gauge what PBS is offering and we always try to put a local program before it and then lead into the national to just tie it all in together. And that's how we're covering it. Uh, we have a small staff, so we, we have to work smart here at uh, KPTS. And, and part of this, part of healing society is really about taking people of different perspectives, local perspectives, and having them talk to each other. There are unconsciously 
uh, race-oriented, racist attitudes that we might all have, that we hold dear and we talk about in our little groups. But when we start talking across groups, we start to discover our own innate attitudinal issues, our own innate racism, and we can actually start dealing with it. And we deal with it because we're talking across the table with somebody who's just different than us and has a different attitude. And now we discover that that person is actually just like us. Uh, and that's part and parcel of what you're doing, isn't it, Victor? Exactly. And, uh, you know, when you look at people individually, we have to admit that everyone has a different frame of reference. Uh, everyone has a different, grew up with a different orientation. But as a society, we have to think more broadly outside of the scope of that uh, orientation in which we were raised uh, or, or that frame of reference that we developed as we were growing up. Uh, we have to think outside of that box. And that makes for a good society. Uh, you know, when you think about the history of the United States, it was formed by protesters, if you recall that. Uh, and, you know, that's what America is all about. And through protests, we express our opinions. We we'll allow our voices to be heard. We let authorities know what we like and what we dislike. And that's what it's all about. And that's democracy. And, and that's the irony of today, because it was formed by protesters. The country was formed by protesters. Yes. It was formed by people who were seeking to have a more perfect union. Right. And it was built by Native Americans, by immigrants of all types, by slaves who came here against their will, by men, by women, by people of all different types of religions. And, and we have to talk about those differences. But then we also have messages that try to divide us so that we don't talk to each other. There's the characterization of protesters as Antifa, terrorists. Um, there's the characterization of people who perhaps have different attitudes than we do as automatically racist. And yes, there are people who are radical on the left and there are people who are radical on the right. There are indeed people who are confirmed racists but we can actually try to bridge these gaps to create understanding because nobody wants to be a bad person. I think there's a real opportunity here to get people to, to sit with that and, and sit through the discomfort to work to a healthier place. So I think this is a racist society in the sense that it, it's, its structure, its laws, its history have been even. We were, we were, this country was built by protesters. It was also built on native land, right, that was taken. You think about what some Native American communities, people being moved around, having their land taken away. It was built with African labor, right? people taken. Um, and even though, you know, slavery ended in 1865, we moved very quickly into laws and practices and policies that limited the freedoms and limited the rights of, of Black people on this, on this land. And that's continued right through to today. It's taken different forms over time, right? But we, we, I think sometimes when people hear slavery, they think, well, that was a long time ago. Well, we've just moved from one chapter to the next in terms of the inequalities in our society. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this moment in time is one that will draw more people into really looking more closely at who we are, how we got to now, and how we build society in ways that, that are more aligned with who we tell ourselves we are and who we want to be and who we want the, the world we want our children to live in, that we build that world. In terms of the role of the media, one of the things that strikes me is that the, the role of media and what media is today has absolutely changed. We see it in, in how uh, information bounces around this uh, echo chamber of ours uh, called America. Uh, it seems to me that now we are all journalists. We are all distributors of information. We are the media, we are the reporters. We're the observers, we're the opinion makers. And it seems that organizations like Facebook, uh, YouTube, which belongs to Google, all these different platforms are actually the publishers of our information. Is there a, uh, a time now where media organizations, which includes Facebook, which includes Google, which include all these new medias, do they have a responsibility similar to yours? Because if you, uh, provided your airwaves for racist rants 
or for incorrect facts, you could be vulnerable. You could be attacked and you could be forced to change your policies. However, we have this, this whole media ecosystem that does not have to live by those standards. Even though if I post on Facebook, I become a reporter for Facebook. I become an editor for Facebook. Shouldn't Facebook be held and Twitter and all these organizations held to the same standards that you're held to? Because after all, what's the difference? I think there's an important distinction in that. I don't think we're all journalists. I think we're all content producers, right? The, the, the phone in my pocket allows me to to capture something and push it out there for the world to see. And I think that the, the challenge there is that as people go and consume it, they need to recognize the difference between the guy in his boxer shorts in the basement, pushing out videos of things that he thinks are interesting and important and, and may or may not be well-informed and actual journalists. And that, that's the challenge our field is facing is that people have begun to equate um, someone with an opinion with someone with an informed opinion <laughs> and someone who's got actual facts. And I, I, your point's well taken. I think that, that Facebook and Twitter and the other social media platforms have a responsibility to uh, monitor and to uh, educate their consumers about the difference between fact and opinion, educate their consumers between the difference uh, between the New York Times and, and the guy in his boxer shorts in his basement, right? Um, it, but it's, it's complicated. And it's constantly evolving. And I think um, there's a great opportunity in, in, in getting other voices, especially diverse voices, into the mix. And there are risks if we don't, uh, as consumers of that information, bring a critical eye to, to what, we're, what we're absorbing and what we're sharing. People often share stuff that has no real um, tooth tied to it. Victor, what do you think? Well, you know, it seems like everyone is trying to play the role of a gatekeeper these days uh, in the world that in the world that is becoming smaller and smaller because of technology. Uh, yes, everyone is um, a presenter of sorts, whether it's Facebook or, or, or some other platform. But when it comes to the content, as uh, Dushan was mentioning, uh, there's professionalism and uh, with journalism attached to it, and there is the, the, the citizen who's just spewing stuff and placing stuff on, on Facebook and such platforms. Right. Now, the professionals are being guided, I should say, by uh, rules from the FCC. Right. Whereas Facebook has no guide, no guidelines uh, for the citizens. Uh, so should it be, uh, should there be guidelines developed? Uh, I think that will come in the future because as it stands right now, one person could damage another person tremendously by just placing something. And that's to me is unacceptable. You cannot do that in, in the society, especially in the civil society where we, want, where we all want peace. Uh, we all, because when you begin to do that kind of stuff, it leads to another form of protest and war and, and problems within society. And we don't need that anymore. Uh, so I believe that there will be a time coming where there should be uh, some guidelines for, for, for posting on, on social media. It seems, to, it seems to me that there should be a discussion about what is appropriate, what de minimis standards would preserve the free exchange of ideas, the truly free exchange of ideas, no matter how uh, to, to me or to you um, um, out there something might be. If you say something that I think is out there, you should have the right to say it, right? On the other hand, we also need to understand these media companies as media companies and subject to certain minimal standards that that are not a threat to a individual um, being um, uh, harmed by untruths. Um, it's, it's really important that we not have uh, our media leverage as propaganda outlets for foreign governments uh, or for uh, fringe groups that are trying to drive narratives that they know are lies. Mm -hmm. um, there are these kinds of, of issues, and if we're all going to be content producers, we're all going to be editors, these organizations are part and parcel of the, of the media ecosystem. They're not separate from it. 
And, and we need to have that discussion. And these leaders need to think about what they are willing and able to do that preserves the free speech rights and not just drives maximal profit. Yeah, it's so complicated, right? Because you think of the politics involved. Just in the last week, you know, Twitter chose to, you know, note some, some uh, in a couple instances, some, some tweets that the president put up where there were, there were inaccuracies in them, put it that way, right? And so they noted such, and he came for them, right? It's, it's, it's political now. And so I think that's where some of the concern comes around regulation because it's, it's question at times of like, who's, who's doing the regulating and for what purposes? So um, as, as we look at this uh, landscape going forward, we have a nation right now that in addition to the discussions surrounding race, uh, there are also other intersecting issues. Um, there is the issue of how COVID-19 is affecting each community. Could you talk a little bit about how that is is being experienced and what the worries are going forward. The experts are saying that because of these protests and people gathering in groups because of the reopening, we may have a double dip into uh, the spread of the pandemic. And we know from 100 years ago from the flu pandemic that the greater number of deaths and the greater number of illnesses came in the second wave. Um, how are how are how is each of your communities uh, dealing with this, Victor? You want to uh, kick off here? Well, you know, I'm very concerned about it because, well, for 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 the state of Kansas, we are fortunate that it's the 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 numbers are not very high compared to other states. But with the protests going on, um, you can see that the states in which these protests, for the most part, that are taking place. Uh, the, the numbers are continuing to go up. Um, and, and that concerns me because things have been shut down before. It's affected the economy. Uh, I'm wondering now, what can we expect? Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm no predictor, but I think it, it may get worse. Uh, and that could really have an impact on public media uh, because we depend upon the public for support. And when people are out of work, they will not support. Uh, currently, there's a pledge drive going for public television. And uh, you can see the slowness in the responses right now. Um, and, and it could get worse because when the uh, numbers go higher uh, of COVID-19, I think we'll be in serious trouble. Uh, we know that there was not real action taken in the beginning to halt this this virus. And, and so we just have to keep our fingers crossed. And this is how civil society phrase, right? People are ill, they they can't go to work or or economies get shut down, then we have a diminution of speech because there's not the money to fund it. We have a, a, a we have a diminution of health care because there's not the money to fund it. Um, and all of a sudden, we get into this, uh, this uh, reinforcing spiral down, which is what Roosevelt uh, turned around in the Great Depression um, and through the Second World War and, and the investment in the American economy that came as a consequence of that. But we need today to be thinking, because it's coming. That second wave is coming, isn't yeah. it? I, I think so. And uh, I expect to see it get worse. I mean, you know, it worries me, to be honest with you. Um, we have to all protect ourselves uh, as individuals, and we have to, uh, we have businesses to run, like this public television station, and like uh, Minnesota Public Radio with Deshaun. You know, we, I mean, it's going to be serious, and, and we don't know what to expect. But let's hope that it doesn't get worse. It's the only thing we can do is hope. Deshaun, you, you're in the epicenter of a lot of these, these uh, gatherings. And Minnesota Public Radio is a national treasure, not only to the region, but also to the nation. Um, how, how are you seeing this, um, this developing in your region? Yeah, it, it's concerning. You know, we were doing pretty well on the COVID-19 front. We, we just in the last week or so crossed 1,000 deaths. And I say it that way because, you know, there are certainly areas of the country where it they passed that marker long ago. Um, we've begun to reopen slowly, just as, as the Floyd story came into uh, the fore. And so we've got this mix now of 
some restaurants reopening, some other businesses and spaces reopening, and, and some degree of life getting back to normal happening, and the protests. And I fully expect we'll see both among the protesters and among public safety folks and among other people, journalists who are out in the mix covering it, right? Um, there was no social distancing happening in the midst of those crowds. And we don't have a vaccine yet, right? And so um, it, it's, it's reasonable to expect that we're going to see numbers spike here in the coming weeks. And, um, and, and that's before we talk about any kind of a recurrence in the fall, as we saw with the 1918 pandemic, right? And, and that's still not going to have a vaccine. So it, there, it's hard to know today what that's going to look and feel like, but um, there's no way that it, it won't change the shape of things. And we were already struggling on so many fronts uh, economically. And, and so uh, it, it, it's troubling. And at the same time, it, it's, you can't, you can't blame people for wanting to come out and have their voices heard in such a, such a moment, right? I wonder whether we are we individuals need to change our values and whether this will lead to that in a fundamental way. We have uh, experienced a couple of decades of, uh, I think, what can only be um, described as self-centeredness. Mm. We watch silly programs with uh, with uh, people with too much plastic surgery and and. Uh, and big nails and, and, uh, and cat fights and, and guys who are doing ridiculous things um, uh, together. We, we consume stuff. When our phones get to be a year old, we feel uh, underprivileged and we have to buy a new phone and we have to get our newest fashions and, and all that other stuff. And, and really what's, what's really necessary is we need public media people out there braving the, 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 the crowds and, and braving themselves getting um, this, this terrible disease in order to cover really important civil society news. We need cops who are protecting businesses. We need protesters out there making sure that, that these issues are brought to the fore. We, we need people uh, who are first responders and people who are packing our groceries. And maybe that's where we should be focused on. Well, you know, Mark, uh, the reason why public media is all involved is because public media tell the story best. Uh, you know, we, 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 we really do the homework. We really uh, do the research and, and, and take the time to really present the stories. Um, and, and you wouldn't find that anywhere else. And I think the public is beginning to realize that. And so... Uh, when I look at our numbers here, since COVID-19 hit, of course, more and more people are staying, have been staying home, but our numbers, viewership, has dramatically increased. Uh, people have been turning to us because of the things that we're doing and the kinds of programs that we're presenting. You know, everything is shut down right now. Where would they turn to for, for a concert? Only on public TV, uh, for in-depth journalism, on public TV or public media, including uh, public radio, telling the true stories and the real stories, representing the, the views of, of the people. And, and that's what we're all about. And, but with the protest and the involvement of all of these people, you know, we are concerned. I am, at least. Deshaun, I'll give you the last word since, it's, since this, this situation was really kicked off by the outrage in your city. Yeah, I, I think we have an opportunity here um, to get a conversation going that's different than the conversation we've had up to now and to, and to keep that conversation going. I think the challenge is that people often get tired or bored at sitting in the discomfort that comes when you wade into these issues. And, you know, at Minnesota Public Radio, we're committed to, to continuing to have those conversations in ways to keep people engaged and growing and hopefully, um, connecting in meaningful ways that lead to the healthier society we've talked about. We, we can be as good as our word, we, but we've got work to do. Well, Deshaun Drew of, uh, of Minnesota Public Radio, uh, Victor Hogstrom of Kansas uh, Public Television, thank you both for participating in this, for giving us the benefit of your experience, your people's work. Thank you for your ongoing uh, efforts to draw attention to these civil society issues, to br also bring some joy in a period of trauma to, to uh, folks out there. That's the Nonprofit Report. Thank you attendees for coming and we'll see you next week.